Let's do this. I like this view. <laughs> we just went live as you uh, sort of jammed your... <laughs> uh, excuse me, a forehead. Uh, yeah. So you yeah. see my hairline compared to where it was a year ago. Yeah, I am your inevitable future, Morgan. Yeah, it's <laughs> rapidly becoming the present. I am your inevitable present? Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, that's holiday themed. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Let us know... Whoa, Twitterbot says the show is starting. What is this Twitterbot that says someone in, in Slack just said that the show is the starting? The aliens are here. How does how does Twitterbot know? I don't know. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. Uh, now's your chance to say hello before uh, I say hello back to you. So if you uh, want me to say your name, uh, Go ahead and, and say hi in the chat, and then I will uh, say hello to you all in a second. <laughs> For those of you watching at home, my laptop is sitting on two textbooks, which yep. is sitting on a briefcase, which is sitting on a stool, which is sitting on a chest of drawers, which is <laughs> sitting on the rug on the floor. Yeah. It's very MacGyver-esque. It's, space. it's all a facade. Yeah, there you are in the, uh, um, in the heart of... Uh, of it all. That's awesome. Um, and you're in your childhood home, right? I, I am. I'm in my childhood bedroom, which looks nothing like uh, it did when I was here. Yeah. But I will pull this adorable picture of me off the wall and just do this episode looking like this. <laughs> That's oh. awesome. All right, here goes. Hello to Adam Synergy, Sandy Springman. Uh, Andrew Planet, Bill K, Billy Gordon, Carolyn B, Daniel McCool, Ernie Jacobs, Gary Solomon, Giselle Sabrin, Guido Bibra, Harry Patrick, Hugo Burnham, James Haney, Jessica Feltz, Jim Meeker, John Suffield, Julius Staninosis, Staninonis, Stanionis, uh, Laura Beckful, Larry Beckham, Martini, Martini 3D, uh, Mubin Ahmed, Nancy Graziano, Reflex MLG, Richard Clark, Silva West, B. Susan Hunter, and Tom Van Scotter. Hey, folks. And then all the rest of you who are saying hello now, but you, but you missed it. Well, I'll pick up some here. Did I say uh, Mr. Tolitz 108 and J. Paytam? Anyway, Ranger of the North, David Dunn. Hey, everybody. And we're back. And you thought you you were afraid, weren't you? You were scared that this was not going to come back to, to to happen ever again. But just to warn you, it's you know we're two days away from Christmas, so so this, this is there's not a lot of news. We literally like we're all like banging our heads like what happened? Not much happened. So so don't worry about it. And I'm back from uh, two weeks in the Costa Rican rainforest. Were you on vacation there? I wouldn't call it a vacation exactly. We were uh, we were there for my wife. My wife does macro photography, and so sort of one of her life dreams is to go to to the Osa Peninsula, which apparently has the highest concentration of biodiversity on planet Earth. And uh, so we we went there and spent uh, nine, nine straight days of shooting. And that sounds like vacation to me. I guess, uh, yeah, it was work. It was a ton of work, but it was it was amazing. Like we saw amazing wildlife and insects. What's the coolest and, animal you saw? Uh, there was, let's see. So there was spider monkeys, which are actually endangered, and there was like a big crowd of them. And they every day or so they would pass by where we were staying and and search the area for fruit. And they would just like jump from tree to tree, and then they all sort of swept past like a like a storm. Uh, we saw. Uh, macaws. We saw um, what else did we see? Toucans, lots of toucans. Um, Kuda Mundi, that was pretty cool. An ocelot, a sort of a baby ocelot that was fairly tamed, and then a whole pile of insects, which Carla was pretty excited about. But you know, mostly I just didn't die from oh that's right we saw a sloth too yeah and mostly you know the most poisonous spider in the world the most poisonous venomous sorry venomous snake in the world was there and uh yeah we we survived so that was all good all right should we do we even remember how to do this job anymore it's been like three whole weeks and my all of my skills are rusty but let's uh let's get started 
Uh, I'm going to do this. I feel like I'm forgetting something. No, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do <laughs> that. And uh, let's go. All right. So 552. Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, December 23rd. 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we've got a bunch of cool stories. We're going to be talking about uh, James Webb's test anomaly, a false alarm on the brightest ever supernova. Where will NASA's next mid-sized mission go? We're going to find out about the wavelength of antimatter and an update on OSIRIS-REx. Joining us this week, we've got an all-star cast of regulars. We've got um, Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Happy Welcome holidays, back. Fraser. And uh, people can't see, but you are sort of, the, your laptop is perched on top of books, on top of briefcases, on top of, uh, in your in your childhood home. So The length will go to bring you the science. That is awesome. Uh, we've got Sandy Springman. Sandy, welcome back. Thank you, Fraser. And, uh, and we've got our special guest this week, Matthew Anderson. Matthew, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, and we will uh, get deep into you as the special guest in a second. But but before we do, I just want to remind everybody that this is a live show. Uh, well, unless you're watching this after the fact and then it's not live. But if you are here during the time that it's happening, it is live. Um, so we are, and if you want to go ahead and talk to us, post any questions that you might have, you can do it in the YouTube chat. But the even cooler place is that you can join the Weekly Space Hangout crew community and then get access to this Slack chat that shows up in the live show. So just, and they've got a spiffy new domain name. It's wshcrew.space. How cool is that? So go ahead and join that community. Uh, you'll get access to the Slack. It's all it's all free. And then the other cool part, of course, is that is that as a member of that community, you become one of the executive producers of the Weekly Space Hangout and help find the guests, help drive the stories that you want us to cover, really, you know, uh, reach into our skulls and just play us as a puppet. So that is, that is the power of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. We are uh, your servants. All right, well, let's get on to first, we're going to start with our special guest, and then we will move on to some of those uh, news stories of the week. All right, uh, Matthew, who are you and what do you do? Thank you, Fraser. Well, my name is Matthew Anderson, and uh, I'm here to talk about my book, Our Cosmic Story. There's a you know a little bit of a history behind that, of course, on why did I write a book. There's always a interesting story. Yeah. Do, do you have a prop to go along with the uh, with the? With... I do. Yeah, I do. Right, right here. Here it is. This is actually the first draft copy. This is the first copy that I. I had to see what it looked like in person, and of course, there's some. There was a couple of issues with it that are now fixed. If anybody, when this is published on January uh, 6, gets a chance to to get it, you will get the nice, fresh, corrected version. And so, your day job, you work for a video game company out of Austin, right? That's right, Portalarium Studio. We're working on Shroud of the Avatar right now. It's a hybrid MMO slash RPG by Richard Garriott. And I actually put a quote in the book uh, by Richard Garriott. Any gamer fans of the Ultima series will know who that guy is. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about Richard Garriott many times in the past. Uh, of course, those of you who love video games, he's a, you know, a huge star in the video game field. I've killed a lot of time with the Ultima series, but he is also been to space that's right yeah he is a the first private astronaut to to fly into near earth orbit yeah that's just that's just amazing uh so you get a chance to work with him on a on a daily basis which is impressive so send him our regards ask him when he when he wants to be a guest on the on the space hangout we'd be glad to have him uh but uh let's talk about so so then what was the inspiration for working on this book well, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. First, I started to see a lot more interest in space in the computer game industry, which is exciting because that's one of my hobbies I like to learn about is you know, just what's going on in space today. What's, uh, what are the new technologies of exploring the farthest reaches of our universe, our known universe at least, and, and 
the the more uh, out there ideas of the multiverse, et cetera. And just all of those uh, that when I worked at a company in Houston just a couple of years ago, they were talking about these. And that really got me excited because I was thinking, okay, I love games. And now we're talking about space. And now we're talking about making a game that's about space. That's cool. So I got really excited about that and started to, to give them my thoughts on what I learned uh, reading papers and, and about these topics of planetary science and you know, what makes a planet habitable? What are the chances of alien races out there? what are the chances to communicate with them all those sort of things and so we started to talk about it and I next thing I knew I was a kind of an advisor to a couple of these studios on the, you know, talk, what what's the facts of these elements how can we make this into our game as realistic as possible and after that uh, you know I said hey you know you know I'm reading about all these little topics here and there how does this come together how does this become a description in, in one book that you can read and go, hey, this is this is our universe. This is how it works, at least on a physical level. And that's how the idea for the book got started. Well, but I think that there's definitely a resurgence or at least a, a kind of a commitment among game developers to try and inject a certain amount of serious science into the work they're doing. And of course, some of the most beloved games, ones that we talk about quite a bit here, are things like Kerbal Space Program and Universe Sandbox and, and things like that where where the the science takes a certain level of primacy as opposed to necessarily trying to make a cool video game. And of course, the magic, like like with movies, like with The Martian stuff, can you do both? Can you tell a great story while respecting the science at the same time? And so I'm sure as you, you know, did that research and, and learned about all these these cool concepts, right, and how you're going to get them into the, into the video games, it's a whole new rabbit hole. Yeah, and it, it's interesting you mentioned Universe Sandbox. That's obviously one that I really enjoy. Uh, I have it on Steam, and I... I had a, a grasp when I first got it of, you know, how orbital mechanics works. I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm not, you know, deep into the math, but, you know, you get that overview grasp and you understand, okay, this is just how our solar system specifically works. And then I thought, you know, as the gamer side of me, I said, well, let's see what happens when I speed this thing up just a few times. And so I sped it up to, I don't know, it was some crazy amount, like, a thousand years every real world second and it was going fine for a while but then for no apparent reason a couple of billion years later the earth and the inner solar system planets just flew off into deep space and i'm going what is this <laughs> yeah well apparently there's like a, a chance that <clears throat> because of jupiter uh it will kick mercury out of orbit and this, this chance has been there since the beginning of the solar system, and there's still I forget the number. Like in you know before the sun turns into a red giant, there's like a I forget the number, so I'm not going to say some percentage chance that Mer that Jupiter will kick Mercury completely out of the solar system because of these gravitational interactions. Uh, you know I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, count on on the far future right of it actually. Oh no, is my phone going off? Holy cow! Never mind. So now you got a chance as writing this book to get some pretty cool stories about space and astronomy. So can you tell us some of the stuff that, you, that you're talking about in the book? Yeah, so let, why don't I give a, a basic overview because it's more than just astronomy as well. It's The book is about a, the big picture of our existence. And it goes into mostly the, the, the physics, the, 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 again, the very light on math. Don't be you know, afraid to read it because you think there's going to be equations left and right all over the place. It's not the type of book. It's for, it's for the casual reader to get a basic overview of, well, I'm on this planet. That's cool. Uh, how, did, how did we get here? How did life actually start? And while I don't obviously have an answer for that because we don't know how it literally started, we have some good ideas. You know, I talk about that. I go from the, the genesis of life to, you know, the evolution, the process of how it became complex thinking beings on a orbiting body around a, a star. 
and what are the chances for that elsewhere so the the first chapter is really just kind of a quick review of like hey earth that's pretty cool it's 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 a really nice planet or you know we're here uh except for today it's uh, it looks like it's a blizzard outside here outside <laughs> my house but besides you know the the snowy days or the the stormy days the it's a nice planet it you know we, we wouldn't be here otherwise if it was something like Venus or Mars or otherwise. And, uh, you know, I just give an overview of that. Then I go into life itself. Well, okay, we have a nice planet. That seems to be a good prerequisite for life. Perhaps not exclusive, but, uh, you know, we're here and this is, you know, uh, the only starting point we have, how did life get started? And I kind of walk through, you know, basics of evolution and biology and a little bit about DNA and then uh, go into the, the push uh, the evolutionary push on, of natural selection to get intelligent beings on a planet, uh, complex organisms, and uh, do a little history of our, our 4.54 billion years uh, overall of not just life, but the planet itself. And then uh, talk about the history of civilizations. After you get life, you get hopefully intelligence on a planet and that people start walking around or beings start walking around and start, you know, talking to each other and going, Hey, let's, let's build some stuff. Right. Let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, we've got storms every week. We got to have shelter. We've got roving bands of, you know, other beings that are attacking us. We got to defend ourselves. All of that comes together into eventually cooperation on at least a local level building civilization. And then, uh, after that, it's uh, the next chapter is what are some of the thinkers that helped to build up civilization from that point to get technology going, to get the tools like that we have right now to talk to each other. How did all this get started? Like, where do we get the metals from? Where do we get the energy from? And so it goes into that component of, okay, if we're going to ever talk to alien races elsewhere, they're naturally, if they're going to be communicating with us, they have to have a base level of civilization and technology. Uh, and then before, that's the first half of the book, before I get to the second half, which is mostly about what's out there as far as star types, planetary systems that we've discovered so far, the tools like the James Webb, well, upcoming the James Webb Space Telescope and others to, uh, you know, see what's out there. I have one kind of mid chapter that just puts the brakes on the excitement a little bit. So I, I'm a little pessimistic here and I say, how long do civilizations last? How long is ours going to last? What are the, you know, the the issues that we've come across already, natural disasters and things of our own doing that could destroy us? And that leads into the conclusion of the book of what, why haven't we discovered any other civilizations so far? And that goes into like the Frank Drake equation and such. Yeah, of course, the Fermi paradox, which uh, you know I've gone on and on on this show and, and other places all, all about. Uh, so you know, is it where do you kind of take a stand on on the the Fermi paradox? How do you how do you feel about this idea that the universe is old and big, and there's nothing in the you know that life here evolved as quickly as it as it could have on Earth. And yet we don't really have any messages or communications from from other civilizations. You know, how do, how do we sort of explain that? Yeah, it's interesting because you even among scientists get vast viewpoint differences on this topic. And I, I, I don't frankly understand quite why you have some scientists who are very much like, well, maybe the aliens aren't contacting us because they they want to keep their little space empire a secret. Well, there's problems with that too. There's always the one guy in the civilization that goes down. He says, "You know what? I'm gonna, I'm a rebel, or I'm escaping the, the local universe prison, or whatever it is. I'm gonna go to Earth and seek refuge, and then we find out who that. Is. And then everybody knows there's aliens. So there's always holes in that kind of plot line. And then you've got the super super conservative uh, scientists who who say or or. It, they usually have multiple viewpoints on this because we really don't know. But there's the viewpoint of, well, we're it. This is this is it. We are rare Earth. There is no others out there because this was a freak occurrence and it'll never happen again. And I take kind of a, I'd say a 40% uh, viewpoint, a little bit pessimistic in the sense of, well, you know, you got all these scenarios, but take a look for a second. Like I write this book at the big picture of the universe and go, okay one we have a vast universe and two we have a lot of time 
And we know that it takes time to develop life, let alone civilization, let alone space faring technologies and, and, and such. So all of that combines into my conclusion that we do pop up regularly. Uh, there are aliens and civilizations that pop up regularly, but their space and time is just simply too vast to where we don't develop the technologies to reach each other. It's just, it's, it's too far distant. Like, uh, for example, I look at it like it's Christmas, right? So you look at your twinkling lights on the Christmas tree and they pop, you know, they flash like this, flash like this, flash like this. Those are, these are civilizations popping up throughout the galaxy and the radio waves go like this and this one pops up. And just as they're like developing radio technology, here's the radio waves from the other civilization. Oh, they destroy themselves. And it goes right on by. Yeah, well, that's you know that whole idea is part of the Drake equation. That, you know how how long really will these intelligent civilizations last until they kind of destroy themselves? And unfortunately, we are sort of entering the period when we start to have access to the kinds of technology and the kinds of capabilities to wipe ourselves off the earth entirely, either through, you know, through in just r waste, wrecking the environment or unintentional consequences of the kinds of technologies we're starting to mess with. Yeah, that's the thing is that we have one of the other ideas of the book that, that I hope readers get is the that we are special. It, there may be billions of other civilizations out there and it may be that we can never contact each other because of the time and space distance and technology just has a hard limit at some point or there's fatigue uh, part of the the fermi paradox and the great uh, filter that i talk about in the last chapter of the book as part of the conclusion to this is there's just you know too much too much going on in a home system. Politics, every civilization probably has some level of politics in order to function. Economic strains, uh, natural disasters, and it's not in, it's too much to, to uh, allow for a necessary stabilization of a civilization to develop what is clearly a big endeavor to get into space. It's there, one guy sitting around a campfire and this is one of the examples I put in the book in the rise of civilization on earth is not going to look at the moon and go, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to get my five friends from a couple of the nearby villages together. We're going to build a ladder. We're going to go to the moon. It just doesn't work like that. You need a civilization. You need a vast economic framework with preceding technologies in a, a kind of like a uh, house of cards scenario. And if any of those rungs on the bottom of the house of cards scenario, the energy infrastructure of the civilization gets cut out from it, everything else falls apart. And it, we don't even know if we could ever restart from that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a, you know, that's one of the concerns that we've, you know, here on Earth, we've already extracted a lot of the uh, easily accessible resources um, like easily accessible metals you know back in the medieval times and and you know when where there'd be chunks of iron just sitting there on the ground or oil bubbling up to the surface and that any future civilization trying to restart you know when the when the octopuses or the dolphins or the um you know the the chimpanzees take over it would probably be the the cockroaches uh that they won't have easy access to that to the raw materials because we've sort of taken all the low hanging fruit. Yeah, that's take right. Hundreds and, of millions and of years for them to get a chance to, to use it. Some people say that, well, we can just, you know, put up a bunch of windmills. We have renewable energy technologies, which I think is absolutely necessary to mitigate the the stall of, of economic uh, growth because we you know we have those fossil fuels that are running out eventually they will eventually run out it may take decades it may take 100 200 years if we're very careful with their use but they will run out solar energy for all intents and purposes wind even geothermal won't run out and the the problem with starting over with those after all the easy fossil fuels are used up and you know we we say rightfully easy because you don't get the hard stuff in a cheap way. It just, you, that'll forever, it doesn't make sense to dig up a dollar worth of oil if it takes $2 to get it. Uh, so the, the windmills and all of that is being built right now. And I'm, I'm reading a lot of news about the solar technologies, especially solar and wind 
coupled. Everything else is is uh, below that as far as growth right now in that economic uh, technology. That we are using the preceding fossil fuel technology and infrastructure to build these new technologies. So starting over. You, again, you go back to those four guys in the villages, they're not going to build a state-of-the-art wind turbine. The the sort of the current concept from a lot of people is that, you know, we imagine the future colonization of space and the travel to other worlds as sort of this human endeavor that we're going to get into our spacesuits, we're going to get on our spaceships, we're going to be, you know, standing at the deck or standing in or sitting in the captain's chair as we, you know, engage the warp drive but do you think that's the future or do you think it's more of a kind of a mechanized computer artificial intelligence kind of expansion out into the universe yeah. i'm actually glad you brought that up because one of the chapters talks quite a bit about ai and we're seeing a lot in the news right now just the last few months about artificial intelligence and the inevitability of it it seems and so i think there's two answers to that. One, yes, we will have AI as the lead to space. I think it'll be critical and necessary to have artificial intelligence guide us uh, through physical means like robots and such because they're impervious in many ways to the things of uh, gravity issues, uh, radiation issues that we have problems with when we're in space for just a few months. And there's that. And then I think that there's going to be perhaps the future evolution of our species to just robots and artificial intelligence. Like I, I've, I wrote it in the book, there's a couple of scientists right now that are perhaps many that are suggesting that that is the next evolution of a civilization is when we, if we ever do reach out and discover an alien civilization out there, one, it's probably gonna be very, very old. If we find one and two, it's probably gonna be artificial. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, you know, in getting a chance to look through the, the histories and the thinking of a lot of the, you know, you, you went talked to or, you know, you looked into the writing and research of people like Carl Sagan and Frank Drake and, and all these sorts of people. Were there some some ideas, some stories, some concepts that sort of really captured your imagination that sort of went into chunks of the book? Yeah, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and his Cosmos series really fired my imagination because his series had a very nice, compact, easy to understand view of a lot of these points. He talked about the history of Earth, the, the evolution of our species on it, technology, uh, the, the triumph of great uh, persons and, and great thinkers that drove a lot of uh, successive great thinkers uh, like Isaac Newton and uh, all the way up to Albert Einstein and, and uh, Stephen Hawking's now and the steps to get to greater understanding of our universe and, and better technologies for exploring that and I think his his series if, if there's any well I want to understand what our cosmic story is really about and I think I got an understanding for what Matthew's talked about on this podcast his Cosmos series would be an excellent like preview, I suppose. I wonder if there's going to be a season two of, of Cosmos. I haven't heard anything specific yet. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's a that's a good question. I even he. It seems like Neil deGrasse Tyson is moving on to his. Uh, uh, he has a talk show. So yeah, they do Star Talk. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's fantastic, but uh, you know, it's no Cosmos, so. Yeah, he his uh, Star Talk actually it does. He has a nice hybrid there where he talks about a lot of stuff that's in my book, and a bunch of science topics, but but pushes that into and he has a lot of guests that that emphasize this into more of the uh, cultural societal viewpoint of it. So it's very again very easy to understand. He's wonderful at, at expressing deep level topics on on a basic level, uh, and puts it into like well how does this affect our culture every day and i that's one of the things in the book that i just didn't have time to fit in because the book would be like a billion pages otherwise is the cultural aspect uh, on an everyday level it, it's pretty much the overview of these topics and then i and then i move on to the next topic and how they tie together it just uh, there's there's so much to talk about uh, 
it could be an encyclopedia otherwise. Yeah, uh, well, you, you can always come up with a sequel. Uh, so we're kind of wrap up the sort of interview portion of, of this episode. But, uh, you know, once again, hold up the book so people can see uh, what it looks like when they are passing through their bookstore. Uh, and then let us know where uh, we can find out more. If people want to sort of learn more about your book and sort of keep track of what you're doing in general. Yeah, the, the, you can go to ourcosmicstory.com. I would love it if you would uh, tweet out our, at Our Cosmic Story as well. There's a Facebook uh, page, facebook.com slash Our Cosmic Story. And I'll have regular blog updates on the, the main website, ourcosmicstory.com, on the book's eventual uh, published date, which is January 6th next month. And I'm just putting in the chat, sort of the bottom of the screen right now, instructions on how you can receive a free PDF advanced copy of the book if you want to read it before it comes out, uh, which is to send an email to giveaways at wsh-crew.net with the subject advanced copy of our cosmic story. So thanks, Matthew. That's awesome. Yeah, I look forward to everybody checking it out. And if anybody has any questions or comments on the book itself, I'd love to hear what Is you there think. a deadline on this? When when can this happen until? Uh, the the free copy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bef- Jan- January 6th would be the cutoff. So uh, okay. it would be appreciated if everybody would submit before that. Yeah, so if you're, you're listening to this now, uh, you've got until January 6th. Uh, and then at that point, uh, buy a copy. But uh, now's your chance. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Matthew, for joining us. Uh, again, pass along our regards to uh, to Richard Garriott. Uh, and uh, and just nag him for us. I mean, we'll, nag, we'll nag him through you and uh, see if we can get him to come and talk because he's been to space and he's Lord British. So, uh, okay. Anyway, let's uh, – yeah, that was a total man crush. Um, all right. Let's move on. Um, we're going to talk about the big stories this week. Uh, we've got a bunch from Morgan, but first, uh, we're going to get an update from, from Sondi on what's happening with the, uh, the mission that she dragged us to Florida to check out. Did I drag you? Yeah, I mean, you I dragged did. You're like, hey, it required much dragging. Yeah, yeah, you were like, hey, everybody, let's all go to Florida. Osiris Rex is going to launch. You like rockets. And then, and then we all <laughs> joined you there and watched the rocket launch. And it was, you know, a life-changing experience. I don't know if I dragged anyone. I feel like to most people I said, hey, rocket launch. Hey, okay. And with okay. the exception of my dad and one of my friend's girlfriends, who was convinced eventually that rocket launches are totally awesome, um, Granted, she lives in Orlando. Uh, everyone, everyone had a good time. Yeah, you. I believe- my dad got lost on the beach. <laughs> Yeah, you, as I recall, the pitch was something like, hey, we're going to be in Florida for the Osiris Rex mission. Do you want to come? And uh, we all said yes. And then we all met. And you were there. And Morgan was there. And Morgan Pamela was there. And uh, Matthew Francis was there. And a bunch of other people there. And Pamela we had a, a was there. Yeah, we had a fantastic um, time. And uh, as promised, rocket launch. So what's an update? Uh, so the mission, everything is going great. As far as I know, everything is, is nominal, which is uh, mission speak for everything is fine and dandy is working, uh, just as it should. Um, let's see here. What, uh, everything there's, they're about 0.56 AU from earth right now. That's 83 million kilometers. If you're in metric, it takes a little less than five minutes for light to get to Osiris Rex from earth, which is kind of cool. Um, they're working towards a deep space maneuver on December 28th. So uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. And the exciting thing that's going to happen is there's been all these press releases about this is that OSIRIS-REx is going to be looking for Trojan asteroids at the Earth-Sun L4 point, which is really exciting. Trojan asteroids are asteroids that travel along in the orbit of a planet. Jupiter has two Trojan clouds. Um, Neptune has Trojan clouds, but we haven't detected any Trojans yet for Earth. So in a couple of weeks, we'll be looking for those and that's or osiris rex will be looking for those and that is really exciting now the other update of course is that you're not actually working on the osiris rex mission anymore you're now working on another project with sounding rockets can you give people yeah, sort of an update on that finishing up the paper uh sort of osiris rex related uh but i'm going to be working on a sounding rocket project and so why the heck 
are these things called sounding rockets. Isn't sounding something you do in the ocean? So the Navy has been doing sounding in the ocean for as long as there have been boats and they want to know how deep things are. And so when the Navy got a bunch of these captured V1 and V2 rockets from the Germans after World War II, they started using them to probe the atmosphere in the ionosphere. And so they said, let's call them sounding rockets since we're doing the same thing in the atmosphere that we were doing in the ocean. And so sounding rockets are sort of, um, they're blue collar rocketry. They're sort of the, my new boss calls them, bottom feeders of the space program. And so with sounding rockets, failure is an option. Unlike in the balloon program where, you know, failure is assured. <laughs> oh. um, so with sounding rockets, you have these rockets that are about like this big around. So you can kind of awkwardly try to hug one, but you probably won't get your arms around it. And so they take instruments to the edge of space, they get to about suborbital altitudes, and it's about a 10 minute flight and you get about five minutes of data. So the thing comes back into the atmosphere and uh, your experiment then parachutes off and you collect it and hopefully it still works. Um, somewhere around here, I have some zip ties that were actually used to attach a um, sensor to a bulkhead and they survive the flight to space and back. Um, so that's sort of exciting. Uh, we're going to be doing ultraviolet instrument development for measuring velocities in the interstellar medium of neutral hydrogen crossing from the interstellar medium into the heliosphere. If that doesn't make any sense, that's fine. No one really understands space physics. Uh, but the cool thing is that you get to play around with ultraviolet detectors, you get to play around with vac ion pumps. But the challenging thing about sounding rockets is that everything's in the ultraviolet. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, but it requires high voltage for these pumps. And so when you have high voltage and you have a sounding rocket that goes from one atmosphere at the surface to vacuum in just a couple minutes, you can actually have a lot of problems with things outgassing on your instrument. So you have to have low outgassing tape, low outgassing zip ties, because if you have a lot of gas that's produced in your experiment with a high voltage, you can actually get arcing from the high voltage and you can have things catching on fire. I've never that's thought awful. about the outgassing from the zip ties. Yeah, there's actually like every spacecraft has outgassing when it launches into space. I think I even heard that OSIRIS-REx might have had some outgassing that was affecting some things, but it's fine, it's nominal, everyone expects that. Um, except with uh, sounding rockets, because everything is sort of very seat of the pants and there's a lot of tape and there's a lot of zip ties used, you have to get special ones that don't outgas a lot. Uh, Eric Knapp wants to know if you're involved in any of the launches out of Poker Flat near Fairbanks. I uh, no, we'll not be going up to Poker Flats. We will be launching out of White Sands in spring 2018 or spring 2019. And if we're really lucky, we'll be launching out of Woomera in the Australian outback. So I don't know what I'm going to eat there since I'm gluten free and they have a lot of fish and chips. But I think I'll, you know, maybe I'll go catch a kangaroo or something. Take me with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, All right. That... I, I promised Nadia Drake that she could come to a sounding rocket launch because she's never been to a, a big rocket launch. Could you also so, promise that to us as well? You can come, but I don't know where you'll stay. All right. No problem. In, <laughs> sort in that out with the kangaroos. Yeah, with the kangaroos. We'll, uh, we'll set up a tent in the, in the desert. Uh, awesome. Okay, Morgan, let's, uh, let's move on and, uh, and talk about uh, a piece of news. Let's talk about what's happening with James Webb. It's hard to believe, but... We're actually almost close to the end of the James Webb Space Telescope project. Um, this is the successor telescope to Hubble. Instead of viewing primarily in the visible, it's going to view uh, primarily in the infrared. Uh, and it's supposed to be launched in about two years, in late 2018. Uh, and with two years left, they're more or less done building all of the pieces of the telescope, and they're starting the process of bolting those pieces together. So they've ground all of the sections of the mirror, they've produced all the instruments, they've designed and built the solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. And now basically, just like a Lego kit, you're going to plug all those pieces together to make one big working telescope. Um, and then the next step is to send it to space. And going to space is a, a really uncomfortable uh, endeavor because you're bolted on the top of a really big rocket. It's going to be flying the Ariane 5 rocket uh, built by ESA. And these big rockets just shake back and forth just an incredible amount. So much so that, you know, tape and zip ties, et cetera, is not nearly enough to hold stuff down. And you want to make sure that when you put your $8 billion telescope on top of this rocket and send it to space, that you're not going to shake anything loose. Because James Webb is going to a Lagrange point outside of Earth's orbit. 
And that means unlike Hubble, if something uh, were to go wrong, there'd be no way for us to send a, a mission of astronauts to go and, and fix it. It's going farther uh, away from Earth than the moon is. We've never been out that far. There's no chance in the next few years that we'll have the capability of repairing it. And so they're putting James Webb through a whole series of different tests to make sure that when it vibrates its way up to space and then encounters uh, space for the first time, that nothing goes wrong. And that includes tests like cooling it down to the temperature of space. Now, for something like James Webb, that's not quite as cold as you might have if you were sending something, for example, to Pluto. But it's still colder than your lab here on Earth. So you put it in a chamber, you cool it down, you see, does anything get brittle, does anything break off, things like that. Another thing you do is you put it in an enormous vacuum chamber and you pump out all the air until you get a vacuum that resembles the vacuum of space. Uh, and this is to check for exactly the sorts of things that Sandy was talking about. You wanna make sure that in uh, a vacuum that bits of your spacecraft aren't spewing out gas trapped within them because that can uh, cause dangerous arcs. Like she mentioned, it can also just mess up your uh, instruments. If there's gas floating between optical layers that you expect it to be empty, that's gonna mess up the path of light, et cetera. And you're not gonna get the pictures that you want. Uh, and then another series of tests that they do uh, is to put pieces of the spacecraft on an enormous vibrating table and shake them uh, at the same level that you would experience on a rocket. In fact, you try to shake it basically in the exact same way that the rocket ride uh, would experience it. And for a smaller spacecraft, you can put the whole thing on a table and shake it back and forth. But with a big spacecraft like uh, James Webb, you're going to put pieces of that spacecraft on the vibration table initially and see, okay, does this instrument work? Does that instrument uh, work after you vibrate the heck out of it? Uh, and so they were doing these tests uh, in the last few weeks and they encountered what they called an anomaly. And NASA has been very cagey about what this anomaly uh, means other than the fact that a vibration sensor, a force sensor that they had placed somewhere on the spacecraft uh, gave readings that were in excess of what they were expecting to find. It wasn't vibrating in the way it was supposed to vibrate. Uh, and this is gonna put the brakes on uh, future uh, development until they can track down exactly what the problem uh, is. Because you don't wanna attach more things to a spacecraft that might already have a loose part uh, somewhere on it. And so they've performed a large number of visual checks of the spacecraft to see, does it look like anything's bent where it shouldn't be bent, or is there a crack where there shouldn't be a crack? And they don't see anything like that. And so at this point, they're going to have to determine, was this an instrumentation problem? Was the sensor not working right? Uh, was this uh, a vibration internal somewhere that couldn't be easily visually tested? Uh, and before they can move on, they need to find it, resolve it, put it back on the table, shake it again, and make sure that that part still isn't behaving abnormally. Uh, because if this were to get to space uh, and cause a problem, like I said before, there's basically nothing that we could do to fix it. And that's the big fear with James Webb, is it's a telescope that is substantially more complicated uh, than the Hubble Space Telescope was, uh, both in just its sheer size, but also in the number of moving parts that it has. It has a mirror that's going to unfold rather than a solid single mirror like uh, Hubble did. And so we have to be sure that it's going to work when we send it up there. When you have so many different moving parts, uh, there's a lot of things that can interact with a lot of other things. And we've got to test all of those before we can send it to space. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a, you know, the size of this observatory is at a, you know, whole other scale compared to things like Hubble. And to ensure that it does make it safely to space has got to be just the top priority. I mean, it's already so far over budget. It's the delays, it would really suck if something happened when it was launched and, you know, it wasn't, it didn't safely make it to orbit. Although I do wonder, you know, you say there is, you know, it's not planned to be repairable by human beings, but, you know, wouldn't that no, be... 
just no, you'd like, it's, there's just no way to, I mean, right now it's like, what, that's like going to be a 10th of an AU away from earth. Like we've never sent humans that far. I n never have yet, but, but here's Not a goal. Yet, here's, you know, Orion's ready to go. Uh, you know, put humans in the Orion capsule and send them out on this perilous trip to repair that now it, it won't happen. Nice telescope you've got there. Shame yeah. if something were to happen to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but still, so so you know what kinds of delays are we looking at here, Morgan? Do you think? So they haven't been specific about uh, what length of delay, and it will certainly depend entirely on uh, what the problem ends up being. If it's an instrumentation problem and really just a bad sensor, that could be uh, a delay of a really short period. If it's a problem sort of deep inside the interior of the spacecraft or with one of the spacecraft's instruments, uh, then it could delay some things. Uh, until that piece is rebuilt or repaired, uh, and they haven't uh, haven't said anything. Now we should say we should just note that these kinds of delays aren't unusual, and so this is not some sort of completely out of the blue, unexpected thing to happen. All large spacecraft problems like or projects like this have problems, and there's time built into the schedule uh, to take pieces off and open them up and fix them as as needed. And so this is, you know, not NASA's first rodeo, and this is not the first time that a shake test has resulted in a problem. And it'll be found, and it will be corrected, and hopefully we won't have to uh, slip the overall schedule any substantial amount of time. It's an amazing process. I sort of imagine, you know, they take the whole spacecraft, they just shake it, and they listen, and then, like, it just it doesn't sound quite right. Like, it's shaking and rattling, but not in the way that they were expecting. You know, you, you know like, you hear that? That little kind of pinging noise? That's, uh, that's not good. So it's yeah, I remember Steve Squires, who was the principal investigator for the Mars rovers, saying that the shake test is the most nerve-wracking uh, moment of uh, the entire assembly process for uh, the spacecraft team. Because this is where you sort of, the rubber meets the road in terms of did the engineers you know do all of their engineering correctly uh, because if something is weak and you start shaking the heck out of it you could do substantial damage to a piece uh, of your spacecraft and and so that's a real sort of heart-stopping uh, moment to watch you know this billion dollar piece of equipment just get shaken back and forth uh, violently yeah all right, let's let's uh, let's move on to uh, our next story that sort of came in over the last couple of weeks, and this is that we finally know the uh, the wavelength of antimatter, Sandy. Yeah, isn't that exciting? So, you know, some of my friends were kind of sad that when you take spectra of antimatter that you don't get a completely different color that you can't see. But Morgan was saying, well, maybe there's a chance that uh, uh, we just don't have the capability of measuring it. But um, so antimatter, what we've been... <laughs> Uh, the idea is that you would look for transitions um, between electrons in various uh, states of hydrogen, of antihydrogen. So hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Everything sort of comes down to hydrogen. And so uh, they at CERN, they made anti-hydrogen and then they stimulated it with a laser and they looked at the light that came out and they found that the light that came out of the stimulated anti-hydrogen is actually the same uh, wavelength as light that would come out of normal hydrogen so that's sort of exciting it, um, it's got to be tricky tricky business to like if i you know if i understand my spectra correctly right you are you know, you're looking at the light that's that's coming off of the element, and you're then breaking that into the spectra, and you're looking for those those sort of peaks and and uh, you know to tell you sort of what the light is, you know what what it's comprised of, and that the and so what you're saying is is that the antihydrogen, the spectra coming from antihydrogen, perfectly matches the spectra from regular yeah. hydrogen. So that's actually really cool because it shows that there's this sort of fundamental symmetry uh, between matter and antimatter. And that says that matter particles and antimatter particles, they should be pretty much identical, except that when they meet, they annihilate each other. <laughs> but the fact that the energy levels for antihydrogen are the same as normal hydrogen to the same precision is actually really neat. And so the only difference is that they sort of have this different charge. I think the, ma the particles at the end of the day. So it's a cool test to see sort of if our models are right or wrong. But the amazing part, of course, is that getting spectra is a difficult enough process and creating anti-hydrogen or positrons is a really difficult process to gather enough that you could then look at the light. You know, they must have been been 
you know, that's the challenge is to get enough that you can actually see the spectra of it. Yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, the huge experimental challenge, this was done at CERN, right, which is a huge facility with a ton of energy that, um, you know, you need to be able to trap these anti, you need to be able to make these antimatter, antihydrogens, and then trap them and hold them there, and then laser these things until they have light come out. So this is sort of a, a, a step in the direction of figuring out why in the universe we have this preference for anti for normal matter rather than antimatter. I mean, some models say that they should have been created in equal amounts, um, but we don't see that, right? Like whatever antimatter was there after the Big Bang got more or less annihilated and was turned into energy. So why why is there this asymmetry? And that's sort of what's being studied at CERN. And I guess it takes away one of the possible tools that you might use to seek concentrations of antimatter out there in the universe is that if it did have a different spectra, you could turn your telescope on, look at a galaxy that's maybe largely composed of antimatter, see the telltale signature in the spectra and say, oh, okay, that's an antimatter galaxy. But, but I guess because it's going to look exactly the same as regular matter, it takes away that as potentially as, a, as an observational tool. Yeah, and I want to clarify that they didn't actually trap the the antihydrogen, but they and they weren't really able to directly observe it, but they were able to take spectra of what happens when uh, the antihydrogen emits when it's been stimulated by a laser. So that's pretty cool. Who doesn't love lasers? They really bring out the best in all signs. Lasers, shark mounted lasers. All right, uh, let's move on. Or uh, bird sea bass. Morgan Renberg. We're going to talk about the false alarm on the brightest ever supernova. Wow. Yeah, this was a story that we might have covered about a year ago when astronomers announced that uh, they had observed a supernova that was more than twice as bright uh, as any previous known supernova. In fact, this would uh, fall into a category of ultra-luminous supernovae. So the supernovae that seemed to be uh, even brighter than what we would normally think of as a, as a supernova. And that was shocking because supernovae are some of the brightest uh, events in the universe. When a star goes supernova and explodes at the end of its life, uh, it can briefly outshine uh, the light uh, of all of the other stars in its galaxy. So you can imagine one star suddenly becoming a uh, hundred billion times brighter if we were to take the Milky Way, uh, for example. And, and that makes them really easy to observe all over, all over the universe because we can see something that bright from really, really far away. Uh, and when we see a supernova like this, we try to come back to it periodically and make more and more observations uh, to see how uh, this sort of the process is progressing. Is it dimming? Uh, is there material moving out from the star? Do we see uh, a nebulae forming like the Crab Nebula, for example? And as astronomers have been doing this over the last year, uh, they discovered that this bright flash wasn't a supernova after all. Uh, it was instead what we call a tidal disruption event. Uh, and a tidal disruption event uh, is when a star passes very close to a supermassive black hole and is just torn to shreds by that supermassive awesome. black hole. I mean, not awesome for the star, but, you know. Yeah, awesome. bad news for that star, bad news for the planets and uh, any life that might have been around that star, but really, really cool for us. And the way we can tell that this is an um, tidal disruption event is because uh, the way that the, the star got really bright and then it got dimmer, and then it got brighter again, and it got dimmer again, and it kind of bounced back and forth. And you can imagine if you had one big explosion, it's gonna start off really bright and then kind of get uniformly dimmer after that. But if you have a star that's in the process of being torn apart, uh, at different times it can be emitting different amounts of light depending on what's blocking it, or how these bits of the star might be interacting with one another, other material that might be around the black hole. And so we can uh, determine pretty conclusively that what we're seeing is not the brightest supernova, but instead this big um, destruction of, of a star. And from this destruction, we can learn a tremendous amount about the supernova, it's, or about the uh, black hole itself, uh, because different black holes of different masses will destroy um, stars at different distances from them. And, and so by measuring how far this star um, was from the black hole when 
it uh, was torn apart, we can figure out how, how massive this black hole might be. Uh, and it seems to be about 100 times more massive than the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, and so that's a, a tremendously uh, powerful uh, black hole. And we can also tell based on the sort of mechanics of how this breakup occurred, that this black hole must be spinning extremely quickly. Uh, and that's really interesting because it tells us two of the three fundamental properties of a black hole. This is a uh, important realization uh, of the 20th century is that you can describe black holes with three numbers. The amount of stuff that's in them, that's its mass. The amount of charge that's in them, that's how many more electrons than uh, protons you have in there, and the rate at which they spin. And if you know all three of those things, then you can pretty much exactly figure out uh, what the black hole must look like. And just by watching this one star get torn apart, torn apart, we can measure its mass and we can put solid constraints on how fast this black hole must be rotating. And that gets us two thirds of the way to understanding this supermassive black hole. It's pretty amazing to me the, the, that the amount of energy released from this event was sort of on the same spectrum as a supernova because we always talk about how when a supernova goes off it is you know releases as much energy as the rest of its galaxy combined uh and yet here is a here's a situation that wasn't a supernova it was it was merely a star being torn apart by its supermassive black hole an event which happens i don't know more regularly less regularly than a regular supernova you know I think we had even a, an event happen just a, just a couple of years ago where maybe it was a star, maybe it was a gas cloud, got very close to the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way and got noticeably brightened. Even small amounts of material hitting the supermassive black hole release a tremendous amount of radiation. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I wonder how much of these kinds of events out there are tied to this and how, or how much of them are the, are the supernova that we always knew. Yeah, even after they figured out that this was a tidal disruption event, it's still uh, an event that's really puzzling astronomers. Because I was reading through the, the scientific paper that announced uh, this realization, and they calculated that to be as bright as it is, uh, about uh, half of the star's mass must have been turned into pure energy. So that's if you take E equals mc squared, which tells you how much energy you get from a bit of mass, uh, you'd have to take about half the mass of this star and convert it into pure energy to see it be as bright as it is. And they're not exactly sure how uh, this tearing apart process with the black hole results in such an efficient conversion of matter into energy. Uh, but now that we have identified one of these, uh, we can continue to follow it up now for more than a year, see how this process plays out. Uh, and see what other effects uh, we might be able to observe that would help us understand the mechanism that causes events like this uh, to be as bright as they are. All right, so we got time for uh, one last story. Uh, also in your wheelhouse, Morgan, let's talk about uh, NASA's next mid-sized mission. So a couple of weeks ago, NASA uh, released what they call an announcement of opportunity or an AO. And an AO is basically saying, we're listening for new proposals on missions right now. And it gives you a certain period of time, it's usually a few months, to put together a proposal for another mission uh, to be launched in and built by NASA. And then NASA collects all of these and they start going through a process of reviewing them in stages. So they'll go through and they'll pick like their favorite 10 and then they'll pay each of those groups a little bit of money to write a more comprehensive report. And then they'll narrow that down to two or three and they'll pay uh, those two groups additional funding uh, to develop like detailed engineering plans and things like that. And then once they have all of that information, they'll ultimately select what will become the next mission to fly. Uh, and this AO was for the next uh, New Frontiers uh, mission. And that's the medium size uh, class of missions. So this is missions like uh, New Horizons, uh, or OSIRIS-REx that cost somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. And unlike the small missions uh, called Discovery Class, which uh, NASA allows scientists to propose to do anything that they want, there are guidelines for what topics basically these missions can address. So they released a, a list of topics and this will tell us one of these things will be the next mission 
that NASA flies. Come so on, here's, Titan, submarine, so here, here's the list, sailboat. List of choices. The first is a sample return from a comet. So this would be kind of like Osiris Rex meets Rosetta. Yeah, we've already got that. Uh, the next would be a sample return from the surface of the moon, from the South Pole in particular. Yeah, we've this already seen a, those. A valuable way to uh, build up a technology that you'd want to return samples from Mars. Uh, after that is what NASA calls ocean worlds. Um, this is what you're looking for, Fraser. Now we're talking. It's, uh, either Titan or Enceladus. And you could propose an orbiter, a lander. Uh, I suppose you could propose a boat or a submarine. Uh, there's an opportunity to propose a probe to plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn and study what uh, the atmosphere is like. Because when, sure Cassini that's your favorite. Goes in, when Cassini goes in next year, it's going. it wasn't designed... Oh, we've lost your audio. Lost Morgan. Yeah, we lost your your audio, Morgan. I don't know if you need to switch that other microphone. No. No. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can switched. hear you now. Yep. All right, I switched microphones. Um, so Saturn, that's pretty cool. Uh, the next opportunity would be to go out and visit the Trojan asteroids. So these are a population of asteroids trapped by Jupiter's gravity. We think there's as many Trojans as there are asteroids in the main asteroid belt. And this would fly by several Trojan asteroids and then maybe arrive at one or more of them, sort of similar to what Dawn did in the main asteroid belt. Uh, uh, and then finally would be the opportunity to send a mission to Venus that would enter the atmosphere either in the form of a balloon or some other sort of atmospherics oriented mission or one that would go all the way down to the surface and uh, study the surface of Venus. And so if you want to propose a mission to NASA, you've got to fit it into one of these categories. And then based on the quality of the proposals that NASA receives, they'll select uh, some subset of those and we'll have a better sense at each step along the way where NASA might be thinking about for uh, its next medium-sized mission. Okay. Uh, something that goes into the underwater ices would be number one, I think. That would be amazing. Like Something that would like plunge into the tiger stripes on Enceladus and go down and see what's going on down there. That would be phenomenal, although it would be hard to keep the spacecraft clean enough. Uh, everything else is a se is ties for second for me. I think Trojan would be great. Yeah. Samples from the moon would be great. Uh, floating around the cloud tops of Venus would be cool, but that's just me. Now, the ocean world probably has as much public support as anything, uh, but where they're going to find the most uh, difficulty is in convincing NASA that the technology is is ready to go. Uh, because probably you won't succeed in proposing a, a mission that's just going to orbit uh, something like Titan, since Cassini has made hundreds of passes of Titan in the last decade. Uh, so if you wanted to pr pr um, propose a lander on one of these, or even a boat or submarine in, in Titan, you've got to convince NASA that the technology is capable of doing this with a high opportunity for success. You can't say, well, uh, you know, we're basically going to take um, this never tested in any way design and send it to another planet for a billion dollars and just hope it works. You're going to have to show that there's solid evidence that suggests something like that's going to work. And for an ocean world, that might be more difficult than like a um, Trojan Explorer, which is basically going to be a space craft in space that we've seen over and over again. Yeah, that's that's where my uh, that, fine. Uh, you know, it'll work. It'll be fine. Just trust. Just trust us. Uh, I'm 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 stoked. That's a great idea. All right. Well, I think we've reached the time where we sort of come to the end of this episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. We've uh, used up our hour back with you. Uh, so let's move on to the point where we uh, where we find out where to find out more. So uh, let's go, Sandy. You uh, it's been a while. Why don't you tell us where uh, people can find out more about what you're doing? I'm still on Twitter. I just broke four thousand followers. I have no idea why. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Come join the party. There'll be a lot of puns. Uh, you can follow at, at Sondy. At Sondy, S O N D Y. And if you like cats, you can follow Observatory Cats on Twitter as well. I should resurrect that Tumblr at some point, but um, all cats all the time over there. Some of them are pretty nerdy. And yeah, 
<laughs> Morgan can probably attack. Morgan, I don't think, follows Observatory Cats. But I was recently endorsed by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter of having some of the best cat photos on the internet. So. And the internet is like 50% cat photos. So that's a pretty impressive uh, accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you. Morgan, where do people find out more? Well, if you'd like a cat-free Twitter, I suggest you go over to at Morgan Renberg. You can check out my website, uh, morganrenberg.com. And next week, I will be taking vacation in Europe. So if you know of any cool things to see in London or Athens or Paris or Frankfurt, then send me a tweet and let me know what I should check out. That's, uh, that's awesome. All right. And Matthew, you stuck around. So now we get a second version. So where can people find out more? Yeah, you can go and follow me on Twitter at Our Cosmic Story. It's the name of my book, Our Cosmic Story, and I'll, I'll just flash it up here for you guys one more time. This will be available on January 6th as a ebook, hardcover, and paperback. So pick your poison, and I hope you enjoy the read. You can also follow me at Matthew Anderson, one T in Matthew as well. Um, I do not have a cat, and there are no cats in space, so I'm sorry I have none of those on my tweets. Uh, I don't know if there have ever been cats in space. I think there have. Yeah. Um, Ron right. wanted to launch a Persian cat into space. There you go. I, I, but it hasn't happened yet. Not yet. Okay, well, so once again... Actually, uh, the Russians, I think, what? took cats on their equivalent of the vomit comet. I wonder if it, like, tore open the fabric of the universe. It's Is really cute. You watch these cats that are, like, not really know what to do with themselves in microgravity. Yeah, exactly. Um... <laughs> So once again, Fraser Kane, uh, at F. Kane, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the uh, to the YouTube channel. Of course, we're at like 96,000 followers, so we're that close. You can make the difference and get and get that silver play button uh, for us. So please do. Another reminder, you can get a free copy of Matthew's book that we talked about here. Just do send an email to giveaways at wsh-crew.net for now. Later on, there'll be the new... Um, the new domain name. Uh, we're going to be doing astronomy cast next, but we're going to be uh, 30 minutes later. So we're going to be starting at uh, 1, no, at 2 p.m. Pacific. So it's going to be half an hour later than we normally do. But go over to the astronomy cast channel and you'll see the live stream over there and we'll just continue the fun. Uh, thanks again for everybody. Sorry that I w w Sorry? We weren't online. S sorry that we weren't online for the last uh, three weeks. Uh, Frazier was out, out in a boat. I was out Oot. in a boat. I was at YouTube in Toronto for one week, and then I was in the Costa Rican rainforest for two weeks. So, uh, But now we're back. I got nothing planned. Space, space, space. So uh, buckle up. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you all next week week let me just get the full group of us here there we go everybody wave goodbye see you later thanks everyone